Hey, Hemi here. Uh, first video, chapter 12 today. This We're moving into an important chapter now in which we look at DNA, its discovery, and how it works. This first chapter, uh, or this first video, the chapter 12.1, uh, we're going to be looking at kind of the discovery of DNA and some of its parts. Uh, second video, we'll look at how does DNA make a copy of itself. And then the last three videos, we look at gene expression. How do we go from how is information stored on the DNA, and then how is that expressed as proteins. Uh, so that's sort of the brief outline of chapter 12. Uh, this first video is going to be a little bit longer, but we want to discuss kind of the buildup. How did we discover uh, DNA in the early 19th century? Well, of the four biomolecules, I mean, people knew that there was some kind of inheritable factor uh, that somehow the genetic information was passed from one generation to the next. Uh, we look back at the last chapter, Gregor Mendel, he didn't know about DNA and genes, but he called them factors. He knew something carried that inheritance, okay? Uh, until the early 19th century, we had it kind of down, or the, yeah, the early 20th century, or, uh, early 1900s, we had it down, scientists, down to two things, two biomolecules, either DNA or proteins, okay? Uh, we knew that there had to be uh, certain traits. Okay, so if you think of DNA, which is like nucleic acids, proteins, uh, lipids, and carbohydrates of those four, uh, lipids and carbs didn't really fit the bill, uh, fit kind of the way it needed to be. Uh, but then these two did. Uh, and if we look at well, what kinds of things are that? Well, it had to be able to store information. Uh, and it had to be able it had to be fairly stable and it had to be able to be copied pretty accurately and in order to get some of the variability uh, some of the differences it had to have be able must have been able to go undergo some changes uh, dna and rna only had four types of nucleotides a t g and c uh, except maybe u if you're talking about uh, rna whereas protein had 20 different amino acids and so scientists thought, well, that is a lot of variation. Uh, that would be kind of the best candidate. And so there was kind of this power struggle between scientists who thought it should be DNA and how, and some of them who thought it should be proteins. Uh, the experiment, we're going to be looking at a lot of different experiments here and how those all built on each other and kind of led up to the final discovery. Uh, one of the first starts to this was Frederick Griffith's experiments. Uh, he worked with mice and pneumonia. And there were two strains of pneumonia he used, an S strain and an R strain. Okay, the S strain was virulent, which means it killed the mouse. Uh, we called it S for smooth because it, it kind of had sign of, kind of a... Uh, gelatinous coat around the colonies or a shiny appearance whereas the R strain or rough strain did not so they were more dull or rough and those were not virulent okay the mice lived uh, what Frederick did or what he noticed is if he put the living S strain bacteria injected it into mice they got pneumonia uh, and he'd find the S strain bacteria in the heart and lung tissue of the dead mouse Okay, so the S strain was virulent and it caused the mouse to die. Okay, the R strain, the rough strain, if he put it into the mouse, uh, the mouse stayed healthy, did not die. Okay, it was happy. When he took the S strain that normally caused them to die and he killed it, okay, added heat and killed the bacteria first, put it into the mouse. Yay, mouse happy, it was healthy. No bacteria found in the heart or lung tissue. And then he did something interesting. Um, he took these two, okay, these two right here, which both mouse, mouse was healthy, mouse was healthy, and he combined the two, okay, and so here's living R strain and the dead S strain, put it into the mouse and lo and behold, the mouse died. 
And when he did an autopsy on the tissues, he found living S-strain in the heart. Okay. Now where the R-strain was alive, the S-strain was dead. So what he proposed is that the living R-strain picked up pieces and parts of the dead S-strain or the genetic material and caused what we now call a transformation transformation all right a transformation something the genetic material was causing a transformation uh, in the r strain from non-virulent to virulent because it was picking up that genetic material uh, from the dead stuff that was in solution that was going into the mouse as well um oswald avery uh, well, and this the Griffiths thing kind of kicked off this whole cycle of experiments uh, in the scientific community trying to figure out what was that transforming substance, because most likely that transforming substance was what was causing the change, which was probably what the genetic information was. So Oswald Avery, along with his lab assistants, McLeod and McCarty, uh, started using enzymes. Okay, they started using enzymes that break down DNA, RNA, or protein, and he treated these solutions. So they kind of repeated Griffith's experiment, except um, they treated uh, they treated the the liquids with these enzymes to knock out the different biomolecules, to break them down, to digest them, and to see which ones still could cause transformation after they they sort of took it out with the enzyme. And here's kind of what they found. They use heat is used to kill the S strain of pneumonia and the capsule component components are removed from the solution. Okay, so he 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 killed the S strain again. Okay? And then here's his control right here, no enzymes used, proteins, DNA and RNA are all present. He added them to R strains and they transformed into S strain. It could kill the kill the mouse. Um, the first one here, he used proteases, okay, which would knock out the proteins. Okay, okay, which knocked out proteins. Well, when he added it to the R cells, okay, they changed. Transformation happened. Okay. Uh, this one, he used RNases, ribonucleases that took out RNA. So he took out the RNA, he added it to the R cells, boom, S strain cells. So transformation in all of these were transformed in these three right here. Okay, in the last one here, deoxyribonucleases, which knocked out the DNA material, kind of chopped it up. Um, he added it to the R cells. No transformation happened. So again, what's your logical conclusion? The R cells, the rough strain cells are picking up something from the S strain that's causing them to change into the virulent type of pathogen. Uh, and so if he knocked out the DNA, they didn't change. So what was causing the change? Boom, DNA. Uh, and so they, they uh, Avery and his fellow researchers printed an article strongly suggesting that the transforming material is DNA. Yet the battle raged on whether the genetic material was proteins or DNA. Okay, they scientists still could not agree, even with Oswald Avery's experiment, pretty much proving that that transformation, transforming substance was DNA, until along came Hershey and Chase that had an experiment using a virus. Okay, now remember a virus is a very simple, debatable, whether it's even living type of uh, the critter uh, that can only live in host cells. And a bacteriophage has kind of a protein coat, a protein coat or capsule, okay, with oftentimes a DNA or mRNA core, 
Okay, so it had two components, and what they did is they radio radioact radioactively labeled the DNA, and radioactively labeled the protein coat in two separate experiments. Let a bacteriophage, okay, a bacteriophage, bacteriophage are viruses that infect uh, infect bacteria. So they let them infect the bacteria. Okay, here comes the bacteriophage. This little alien leggy things. And they would let them, and they would notice that inside the bacterium, it would produce a whole bunch of new bacteria. In other words, viruses work by injecting their genetic material into the bacteria cell. This is the bacteria here and they would take over the bacterial's DNA, use the cell's machinery to make more viruses. They would then explode out through the cell wall and go infect nearby cells. Okay, so they're wanting to know what goes into the bacteria to cause that change. Is it the protein coat or is it the DNA core? Hmm, there we go, the DNA protein uh, kind of argument. Well, here you have an organism with just protein and DNA, and it's causing a change in another organism. So what is it that is causing that transformation? And we'll look at it on the next slide here. Okay, here you can see their experiment. They had batch one right here and batch two right here. Batch one, the bacteriophages were grown with radioactive sulfur. Okay, sulfur, okay, sulfur is found in protein, but not DNA. So in batch one, they're labeling the protein. They grew it in there with this pink color. They let them infect the bacterial cells, and then they put them in a blender. Uh, they agitated them. And what that did is it shook off these the stuff off the outside, and then they centrifuged it, okay, spun it real fast, and all the bacteria went thump they're heavier went down to the bottom of the test tube in this pellet and what they found was the radioactivity was in the supernatant the supernatant is just the liquidy part up here and the pellets with the bacteria no radioactivity okay batch two they used radioactive phosphorus they knew that phosphorus was found in structurally in dna but not in protein and so they grew the bacteriophages in radioactive phosphorus, let them infect the bacteria, uh, agitated them in the blender that shook off whatever was on the outside, centrifuged it to get all the bacteria to the bottom in this little pellet. And then they analyzed it and the radioactivity was inside, okay, inside the cell, okay? The radioactivity from the radioactively labeled Phosphorus. Phosphorus is part of DNA, not protein. So what went into the bacteria to change it, to have the instructions to build new viruses? The DNA. And then this, uh, this experiment kind of settled, sort of settled the argument that, hey, the genetic material, the transforming substance, hey, look at that. Oswald Avery was right. Eh? Maybe we should have believed him in the first place. Um, so that was, you know, that was the genetic information. So now the race was on to look at structurally what was the structure of DNA and how did it work? How did it carry the genetic code? Uh, we still use this transformation process today. Uh, we call them genetically modified organisms. And in the biotech chapter, we'll get a little bit more into this. Uh, one of the invaluable tools is the GFP, a green fluorescent protein found in the jellyfish. Uh, and we've used this green protein a bunch as a genetic marker. And we'll actually work with it in our little AP bio lab in our high school. And it actually makes them glow under UV light. And you'll see on the next slide here, they've done some really cool stuff. Uh, they've made a cat, oh, even mammals, cat, mice, uh, chimps, birds, uh, pigs, frogs, uh, with express this green fluorescing protein. If you put them under UV light, 
Uh, here you see three mice that didn't get the gene. Here are three that did. So some really cool experiments. And they often use the, this GFP as a valuable tool. But uh, just kind of a side note, as some of the cool stuff that uh, we can actually still are doing transformations in labs today and use it as a beneficial tool in genetics experiments. Now, after Hershey and Chase had kind of proved that DNA was the genetic material, the race was on to figure out how it worked. Well, well, they figured out that there were two different nucleotides. Whoops, there were two different nucleotides in the DNA. Okay, there are what we call purines, uh, which are adenine and guanine, and we often abbreviate them A and G, and two nucleotides with pyrimidine bases. And by purine and pyrimidine, we're talking nit nitrogenous bases. Uh, and you'll see here in the structure on the next slide that there's nitrogen involved in that. Uh, the pyrimidine bases were thymine and cytosine, T and C. Uh, Erwin Chargaff. Chargaff actually kind of came up with these rules and started looking at A, T, G, and C in different species, uh, different critters. And you'll see this chart again on the next, on the visual slide here coming up. And he noticed that the amounts of, it wasn't, you, know, you think, well, four bases, it should be 25%, 25% A, 25% T, 25% G, 25% C. Well, he found it was not that way at all. In each species, it was different, but A and T were always equal to the same percentage, and G and C were always equal to the same percentage, and all of them together obviously made up 100% but it might go like 30, 30, 20, 20, okay? And so there were different amounts, but the, the totals of A and T were always close and they always added up to 100. And so this kind of, this indicated some kind of complementary base pairing. Uh, and we look at what we know now, human chromosome on average contains about 140. 40 million base pairs. And so you think about our alphabet that has 26 letters. You know, how many different words can you make? Well, and we know that our genetic code are 140 million base pairs with four letters. How many different combinations can you get? Uh, four to the 140 millionth power? A lot. Pew mind blown uh, and so this would even though there's four bases the order of those bases would provide enough variability for dna to contain the genetic code uh, this slide here is just showing uh chargaff's chart uh this is kind of from his data uh where like he looked at corn was 26.8 percent a and 27.2 percent t and then about 23% G and C. Humans are about 30% A, 30% T, and about 20% G and C. Uh, so you can see it, it is different in different creatures, okay? But they always, the A and the T always seem to be about the same percentage and G and C always tend to be about the same percentage. Uh, if you look at their actual structure, remember I said they are nitrogenous bases. Uh, so here you can see the ends, the nitrogens here in the corner, the rest are carbons and hydrogens and oxygens. Uh, a and G, adenine and guanine, with the double rings are the purines. I remember that because the shorter name is the bigger structure. So the purines have the shorter name, but they are bigger. They are double ringed. Whereas cytosine and thymine are the pyrimidines. Bigger name, smaller structure, single ring. Okay. And again, you can see the nitrogen in there. You know, there was this race, again, to figure out what all that meant. Base pairing, okay, well, there had to be, they figured out there had to be kind of strands. Uh, and they knew that there was phosphate groups involved. Um, they knew <clears throat> that there were uh, deoxyribose sugars 
involved. And then you had your four nitrogenous bases. Okay. And they're trying to figure out how all these things are put together. Uh, Linus Pauling, uh, one of the major uh, chemists of the day in California, actually proposed a paper that said it was a triple uh, triple helix where there were uh, three sugar phosphate backbones with the nitrogenous bases sticking outwards. Uh, and he wrote a big paper on how he thought it was that. Uh, but some of the measurements and stuff didn't quite fit. Whether well, there was this uh, younger two gentlemen in England, okay, James Watson and Francis Crick, uh, who were working on this as well. And they came upon Rosalind Franklin's work. Uh, and they didn't credit her right away um, as much as they probably should have. Uh, I mean, it was kind of hard. A very intelligent woman. Uh, but in King's College, uh, like even the women in the 50s, the women weren't allowed to eat in the lunchroom with the men. Well, the men would be sharing all their ideas and what they found, and she wasn't. And she found it to be very lonely. Uh, and so they kind of labeled her as cranky and mean. And that was not the case at all. Uh, it was just very lonely and frustrating to be working in a male-dominated lab uh, in university. And maybe not given the credit that she deserved. Uh, but she, did, she had a phenomenal ability uh, to do x-ray diff diffraction. I uh, actually started her work. Uh, to get her PhD on looking at the porosity of coal. Uh, and during World War II, uh, really helped develop uh, better uh, gas mass used by the British troops. Uh, well, she started kind of getting in on this DNA stuff as well. And she found that it can be very fibrous, that it was kind of long and stringy and fibrous. And under the right conditions, the fibers would, if she zapped them with x-rays, uh, produce this x-ray diffraction pattern. We'll look at it on the next slide. And they knew, the people that did diffraction, x-ray diffraction work, knew that the, this type of photograph proved two things, that it was a helix and that there was some kind of repetition uh, to it as well. Uh, and James Watson went up to visit and to see what this was about. Uh, Rosalind Franklin pretty much told him to go away. Uh, but as he was leaving, Wilkins, who really was kind of working with Rosalind Franklin on some of this stuff, and they kind of butted heads a lot and didn't get along real well. Uh, as they were leaving, Wilkins stopped James Watson and pulled out this famous picture out of his desk. And I'll show you on the next slide. And what he slipped to Watson is famously known as picture 51 uh, that Rosalind had taken of DNA diffraction, x-ray diffraction of DNA. And it was this, this X pattern. Okay. And right away uh, that clued Watson into this idea that is, it is a double helix instead of the triple helix like Linus Pauling. Uh, Linus Pauling had sort of mentioned uh, and this really, we think this picture was important in helping Watson and Crick kind of come up with their current model of DNA. Okay, when James Watson brought that picture back to the lab, uh, there were several things uh, that they could uh, figure out from that picture. One, it was a double helix. The sugar phosphates were the backbones. Okay, so you had sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. Uh, and on that sugar phosphate, okay, so here's a phosphate group. Here was the five carbon sugar, and it was connected here. Uh, and then our nitrogenous base, our nitrogenous base sticking off over here. So phosphate group, deoxyribose, nitrogenous base, the ATG or C. Uh, but he, they also figured out that they're anti-parallel. Okay, so this is an oxygen right here. This was carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, and carbon five is actually up here. Uh, that when they connected to the next phosphate group of what we would call this thing here, one nucleotide, 
and draw the next deoxyribose. Here's another uh, nitrogenous base. Okay, here's the oxygen. Here's carbon one, two, three, four, five. So this right here, this side of the molecule, you see the points of the of the sugars of the deoxyriboses are up. You'll see that this is the five prime to three prime. So this right here is running five prime to three prime. And then the other side of the molecule over here would be running uh, would be running from the five prime to three prime. So they said it was actually we used the term anti-parallel. Uh, think of a highway where one uh, traffic is flowing this way in one direction, but in the other way, it's flowing the other direction. Okay. So it's in the highway. They're flowing opposite directions. Okay, and down the middle of the rungs, obviously you have A, according to Chargaff's rules, A is pairing with T, G with C, the symmetry, the measurements, uh, how much each rung and twist, everything worked out to the nanometer, and they, he kind of had this voila moment, and they started building this thing out of cardboard and chicken wire, and they built this floor to ceiling model, and you'll see it on the next slide here. Here you can see, uh, here you can see Watson and Crick and their chicken wire model. Okay, and in 1962, they win the Nobel Prize uh, for their discovery of the structure of DNA, and that really led us to our current understanding. So you think about it, less than a hundred years ago, uh, this is a pretty recent, significant uh, discovery. Uh, they published their first sort of one-page paper on it in Nature magazine in 1953. Okay, so yeah, less than 100 years ago. And again, you see their measurements uh, between the rungs, between the curls, uh, and, and the width, and everything worked out. Uh, you'll notice between the nitrogenous bases here, G and C and A and T, are the hydrogen bonds. And you'll see that between G and C, there's three hydrogen bonds. Between adenine and thymine, there's two hydrogen bonds. And you'll also see the anti-parallel nature. So here's five prime to three prime because here's the fifth carbon there, third carbon there. So five to three, five to three, five to three, five to three. It's going five prime to three prime. Over here, you see the point of the, um, the, point of the deoxyribose is flipped down and so this is running the opposite direction you're going five prime to three prime this way and everything worked out perfectly and here's the space filling molecule <coughs> excuse me if you use the actual little atoms and the little um, balls and stuff we use in class and the sticks and stuff to put it together uh, it's pretty cool you, we need a lot more than our little kids have uh, but they figured this out and this really paved the way uh, the last, you know, 60, 70, 80 years here to really do a lot of cool stuff with DNA and figure out how it works and also to be able to manipulate it. Uh, and that's what the future videos are going to be looking at.